friends, my name is Dasha and today I'm going to be bringing you my July wrap up. I read six-ish books in July, you'll see why I said ish, totaled up to about 2,669 pages, give or take. I'm gonna go from my worst to the best and let's just get into it. First book I'm gonna talk about is gonna have its own video coming and that's The Unbecoming of Myra Dyer by Michelle Hodkin. This is a partial DNF. I don't know how to describe it. I could not get through this book. The sticky notes demark pretty much where I stopped and I filmed a rant review but I'm toying with the idea of finishing it to add more complaints to my rant review because this book is really fucking bad. I rated it one star. I don't often rate DNFs because I feel like maybe sometimes I don't get a good enough idea of what's in the book to give a full rating but this one is just so bad that I had to rate it and it gets a one star rating. This book is technically about a girl who has a really bad accident where all her friends died except for her and so she moves to a new town and tries to start over but weird things start happening to her. It's billed as a paranormal slash I guess urban fantasy you could describe it but technically it's really just a paranormal romance if we're being entirely honest and it it's just... <sighs> I can't even call it aggressively mediocre, it's just bad. And I don't like to call books bad, but this one's just fucking bad. As you can see, I have a shit ton of tabs, and I don't usually tab books this much, but this one just deserved all the hate tabbing so I could reference it during my rant review, which you'll see, um, because I have tabs for that indicate cringe, that indicate bad tropes, that indicate character issues, indicate writing issues. I kind of organize my thoughts that way. So again, you'll see it in my rant review that I don't know when it's gonna be up, but I will definitely post it because I need to complain about this book to someone. Um, but yeah, I couldn't actually finish this book. I might, I just, oh. Sometimes it's fun to hate read. I can't, I can't even decide if this one's fun anymore because it's just so bad. I said that a million times, but like there's, there's no other way to describe it. There's so many issues in this book with just really bad characterization. This book just reeks of not like other girl syndrome. And there's nothing I hate more than that, especially if it's a book built towards teenage girls. I also just find the writing is tropey. And while I don't usually hate tropes, and I think in theory there's nothing wrong with tropes, especially in YA, this, these are just not well done. A lot of this screams really shitty fan fiction. To me and I just am surprised that this got published. That's the best way I can describe it, that's all. Um, so once again keep your eye out for the rant review about this. I went off for 45 minutes in my raw footage so editing that's gonna be fun but hopefully that'll be fun to watch too. The next book I'm going to talk about is Cinder by Marissa Meyer. The first book in I think it's called The Lunar Chronicles. The Lunar Chronicles are a super popular YA series, kind of sci-fi dystopian. The first book follows Cinder who is a cyborg living in New Beijing. It's a retelling of Cinderella and I gave this three out of five stars. But honestly, I had a ton of fun reading this. This was a fun book. Like I can see why everyone loves this so much. I really liked Kai. I thought for a love interest in like a YA, he was really fun. Like he was kind. He was not an asshole or a douchebag as you kind of often see. And I thought that he worked really well with Cinder. I thought that they actually made a pretty good pair. I didn't mind Cinder. I actually liked that it wasn't a like one-to-one -one retelling of Cinderella. There was a lot of other elements in there. And I actually just had a really fun time reading it. I was excited to jump back into it every time that I'd have to put it down. I did have issues with the world building. I felt as though it was simultaneously, parts of it were like really well developed and then other parts of it were just not developed at all. I liked the political intrigue. I also liked that it was super bingeable. The pacing was fantastic. There weren't a lot of lulls, even though there were a lot of discussions, again, with like politics and a little bit of character building. Um, Cinder as a character, I felt as though she was a little underdeveloped. She was kind of like a very typical young adult heroine that was just kind of courageous, but she didn't really have too much depth other than being a typical YA heroine. Uh, but like I said, Kai, I really, really liked him. I really liked uh, Cinder's android. She was really cute. A lot of people found her kind of cringy, but I was like, I don't know. I didn't think she was that bad. So I overall like I rounded up to about a three stars because I felt like there were some elements that were really, really well done. I can really understand why the series is so popular, but there were some parts of it that were kind of lacking, um, but it was just fun. 
I might pick up the rest of the series. Sometimes it's nice to just binge like a good old classic 2013 era YA fantasy slash sci-fi. I can't be the only one. The next book I want to talk about is The Exorcist by William Peter Blatty. This is a horror novel about... How do I describe this without ruining the whole thing? If you haven't watched the movie or read the book, the best way I can give a synopsis of this is essentially the young daughter of a famous actress starts acting a little weird, and you also follow a priest that is struggling dealing with his faith and questioning his faith. And um, that's about it. I feel like this is one of those books that's kind of self-explanatory by the title, but it's also fun to not know that much going in. I gave this a four to five stars. I thought it was really phenomenal in the themes that it touched on and the overall messages and especially knowing the time it was published in and the time the movie came out, it's even more impactful. At the time that the book was written and then the movie came out, with the ideas of like the satanic panic and loss of faith in America, I felt like the book did its job in terms of hitting home with American audiences in that respect. And even reading it now, you can kind of relate to those ideas and see why they caused such a big fuss when they were published. Because if I remember correctly, the movie was touted as one of the scariest movies of all time. And I think the book is also considered that. And the lineups outside the movie theaters when it was released were massive because people were just so shocked by what was happening, but they were somehow still intrigued. And while I will say, I don't always agree with how he went about making his point, and that's kind of a personal thing. I do understand why he needed to do it in terms of getting the message across. And you can tell that like the authorial intent was very, very clear with this book. And you could tell that he understood how to drive that point home. It just, I needed to literally put the book down at some point and like take a day or two off. But that was just a very personal thing for me. I just couldn't handle some of the stuff in this book. But like I said, I gave it still four out of five stars. I thought that it was fantastically written. I thought that like the pacing was good. The writing was fairly good. It just was a little shocking at certain parts, but it was also very scary at certain parts. And the ambiguity of a lot of the themes and the discussion around a lot of the themes are really well done. I liked how some of the themes weren't thrown in your face. They were kind of a little more vague in terms of how the characters talked about them and how the characters thought about the themes and some of the stuff that was demonstrated to you. It wasn't all just, you know, tell and no show. It was really, really well crafted. So yeah, overall, if you're looking for horror that deals with specific moral themes and if you like horror that is not necessarily pure horror but leaves a little bit of room for interpretation, I'd really recommend this book. Just be warned, there's obviously some very, very graphic content that was a little, I don't want to say troubling for me, but like I did have to like take a break from the book for a little bit. But again, that's a, that might be just a personal thing. If you enjoy horror, this might not be too much for you. Um, but I do, I do recommend this book. I thought it was a really fucking, really solid read. The next book I want to talk about is The Hundred Thousand Kingdoms by N.K. Jemisin. This is an adult fantasy about a woman named Yin, I believe it's pronounced. She gets a message from her grandfather that she is to meet him in the capital where he is ruler and she basically is possibly in line for that throne next after he dies, but it is a competition between her and two of her cousins. Uh, so you basically follow her. She arrives at the capital within like the first couple pages and you follow everything that unfolds from there. Um, this was a solid ass read. So I will say based on the description, it sounds more like a magical competition. It's not. It is much more political when it comes to the competition for the throne. There is a bit more politics involved in nuance than actual just magic. But the main selling point of this book for me and the thing that really, really was spectacularly done was the depiction of the gods in this book. So in this world, there were kind of three main gods that were siblings that lived in harmony until one of them, the light god, threw out uh, the night god and killed the sister, which was the goddess of life. 
and they had a bunch of children. So you actually follow uh, the children as well as the Night Lord. And the Night Lord, Nahadoth, I am not a romance person. I'm not really a smut person. I don't mind it in my books, but I don't like it that much. I prefer like world building and politics and that kind of stuff. But holy shit, the sexual tension in this book, the actual like scene where Nahadoth gets together with Yin, holy fuck. That was mind blowing to read because Nahadoth is a god and Yin is a mortal. And it's just, I don't even know how to describe it. It's just, I was awestruck reading it. Like it was so well written. N.K. Jemison's writing style is so spectacular. It's so unique. It is so breathtaking at times. She really has something special. Like I have not read a lot of books that the writing is just so gripping, but there's also a fair amount of plot, characterization and intrigue because you can sometimes have flowery writing, like for example, a night circus, but the plot and characters were kind of lacking. This had it all. It was really, really good. The reason I gave it four out of five stars was that I just didn't get that like five star feeling from it, but it was like closer to 4.5 probably. It was phenomenal. The way she wrote from the God's perspective and made you feel like you were actually dealing with gods was really fucking cool. Oftentimes gods are kind of depicted as regular people, but that's, that's obviously not how they are, right? They're immortal beings with infinite wisdom. And I felt like she did a pretty good job of portraying that. When you're dealing with the expanse of this world and all the intricacies and the expanse of the mythology that comes with these gods, it probably could have been expanded on even more. So I just felt like that was a little bit off for me. Like I said, I didn't get that five star feeling. There's just something about it that wasn't quite there, but I think it was still phenomenal. I do also think that I will not continue with this series. The way that this wraps up to me leaves me very satisfied. And I don't feel the need to read the two other books. I don't know. If anyone's read the rest of them, let me know if they're worth reading through. I just, I feel like this one wrapped up very neatly for me, very well. And I consider this kind of a standalone at this point, so I don't know if I'll continue it. But um, if you have not read any N.K. Jemisin, please fucking do. I read the fifth season from her also in June. I'll link my June wrap up where I talked about it. But she's just fucking spectacular. She is such a good writer. So I'm excited to read more from her. I just don't think it'll be in this series. The final book I want to talk about fully in this video is The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. This was fucking phenomenal. This is a classic about a young man named Dorian Gray that gets his portrait painted by his friend and when he looks upon it he realizes that one day he's gonna get old but his portrait is gonna look the same his whole life and he's like, oh, how I wish the opposite would be true. Chaos ensues. What a phenomenal read. I give this five out of five stars. It's probably one of my favorite books of all time now. I thought, I even tabbed the living shit out of this and I don't usually tab books as much, but everything in here was so quotable. Everything in here was so relevant. This book is really, obviously there's a bit of a plot like I mentioned, but this book is really a critique on vanity and society in England at that time. But it's also fairly relevant to today, which I appreciated because not just vanity uh, in terms of themes, but there's also, you know, selfishness and morals and just a lot of really interesting discussions about that. And I felt like it was so beautifully written too that just made it really interesting to keep going because there's all these different topics, all these different themes, and just a lot of very thought-provoking things in here. Like half the book is underlined at this point because everything in here is just so beautiful, <laughs> but also, like I said, thought-provoking and very relevant even in today's society. And I'm also a fairly vain person, I'll admit it. So a lot of this stuff I resonated with. I found that the writing was still very accessible considering it's a classic written in the 1890s, but it was still beautiful enough and got the themes across that the author was trying to. And it's just, I don't know, dude, there's some like life lessons in here. Let me see if I can find some of my favorites. 
The reason we all like to think so well of others is that we are all afraid for ourselves. The basis of optimism is sheer terror. People are afraid of themselves nowadays. They have forgotten the highest of all duties, the duty that one owes to oneself. Of course they are charitable. They feed the hungry and clothe the beggar, but their own souls starve and are naked. Courage has gone out of our race. Perhaps we never really had it. The terror of society, which is the basis of morals, the terror of God, which is the secret of religion. These are the two things that govern us. It just hits different, you know? In terms of classics, I really understood the themes in this one better. I really felt what the author was trying to convey. And I just thought overall, I don't know. I If you have not read this and you think you don't like classics, I absolutely suggest that you read this and it might change your mind on classics. It was fun to read in terms of like the themes. It was funny at certain parts. I actually giggled at some parts. It is thought provoking. It is spectacular, beautifully written. Just 10 out of 10, one of my favorite books of all time now. It's spectacular. I also read two other books for Secret TBR. And I do want to mention that because I did read like six full books this month. I just, Secret TBR, keep your eye out for that. Don't really know what else to say about those. That is it for my July TBR. If you've read any of these, come talk to me in the comments and we can discuss. Other than that, hit me up on my socials and I will see you guys next time. Bye!